Hi, and welcome to the second episode of my vlog, Personal Injury Lawyer Tips. My name is Angie Leroy Rutter. I'm a personal injury lawyer specializing in catastrophic impairment law. I'm also a published author of the LexisNexis Inc. book called Catastrophic Impairment Law in Canada, a director at Head Injury Rehabilitation Ontario, and the founder and owner of my law firm, Rudder Law Group. In this vlog, I'll discuss briefly about the seven steps or primary stages in a tort lawsuit for personal injuries. If you've been injured in a motor vehicle accident in Ontario, if you're involved in a motor vehicle accident and sustain catastrophic or very severe injuries and impairments, then in addition to proceeding with an accident benefits claim on your behalf against your insurer, I'll also kickstart a civil litigation case for you against the at-fault driver as well. I'll do this to claim monetary compensation for you in the form of compensatory damages. If you want to learn more about the companion accident benefits claim and kickstarting the accident benefits application process, then please watch episode number one of my vlog called How to Get Your Accident Benefits Application Started or read the blog of the same name. A civil litigation case is a lawsuit between you and another party or parties, such as the negligent at-fault driver, where there is a disagreement on legal matters. This can range from disagreements over your claim for compensatory damages for your personal injuries and impairments, and a degree of negligence of the other driver to the degree to which the accident was caused by the negligence of the other driver. I'll start your lawsuit by drafting a statement of claim for you, which articulates all of the relevant facts of your civil litigation case, as well as the legal basis for your entitlement to monetary compensation. I'll then file it in the courthouse and serve it on all of the parties I'm claiming damages from on your behalf. This is what we would call the tort action. Prior to starting a tort action or lawsuit on your behalf, you'll enter into a contractual agreement with my law firm. My contractual agreements are almost always a retainer contingency fee agreement, where you don't pay anything up front, but rather I charge you a percentage of the amount of money awarded to you in a successful settlement or court judgment following a successful civil trial. However, I'd explain to you that you have the option of retaining me as your lawyer other than by retainer contingency fee agreement. The other option I present to you is charging you an hourly fee for my legal work done, or alternatively, by accepting court-ordered costs as the fee. You'll be provided with a copy of the signed retainer contingency fee agreement to keep for your personal records. I always begin with developing an initial theory of your case, which I don't view as something that is static, but rather organic, in that it is continually evolving as your case evolves with emerging facts, the application of the law to your facts, and new evidence. Therefore, I'll continue to amend your case theory at the significant milestones that we reach together through the progression of your tort case in the litigation process. I view the theory of a case as the expression of the dominant central position that I intend to assert at your trial, which is the end goal that I set. It's the basic overriding theme which captures in a few words the justice of the position I'm taking on your behalf. It's the message I want to deliver for you that's comprised of mixed fact and law, which I want the jury to accept at your trial. It is imperative that I have access to all the pertinent information from third parties that are relevant to the legal issues in dispute in your civil litigation case in order to start a successful tort lawsuit on your behalf. So I'll have you sign authorization and direction forms which will enable me to obtain the documents in the possession of third parties such as but not limited to your medical reports, clinical notes and records from your treatment providers, your income tax records, your paycheck stubs, OHIP records, pharmaceutical records, 
in your medical, drug, and parking receipts and other relevant documentation. After you sign the retainer contingency fee agreement, I'll diarize the limitation period or deadline for the filing of your statement of claim. I do this because two years after the day on which your claim was discovered, your claim for compensatory damages becomes statute barred. I'll also diarize your ultimate 15 years limitation period too. Your statement of claim is an originating process, which means that it's the document that commences your tort action or lawsuit. Concerning your tort action for personal injuries and impairments, it would explain, but not limited to, the following. One, the specific heads of damages you're claiming and the amount of monetary compensation you're seeking. Two, who you are in terms of being the injured plaintiff. Three, a description of the defendant or defendants who you are suing. Four, a description of your motor vehicle accident and the accident dynamics. Five, the specific allegations of negligence you're making against the aforementioned defendant or each of the defendants. Six, a description of your personal injuries and impairments. Seven, the statutes or legislation which contain specific provisions that you're relying on. And eight, the city in Ontario where you propose the tort action should be tried in. Once I finish your statement of claim, I'll issue or file it in the Superior Court of Justice of the city that we propose your action to be tried in upon paying the applicable court filing fees. Once your statement of claim is filed with the courthouse, they will stamp and date it. Then we have six months to personally provide a copy of the statement of claim to each of the named defendants to whom we're suing, which is known as serving the defendant. Once I personally serve your statement of claim and all of the named defendants, I will ensure that an affidavit of service, which is proof of service, is completed for each defendant and subsequently filed with the court. The defendants named in your statement of claim who have been personally served with it will prepare a statement of defense and then serve it on everyone else named in the legal matter, including me, on your behalf. In Ontario, it is mandatory for all owners of vehicles to purchase third-party liability coverage to protect them if someone else is killed or injured or their property is damaged. Therefore, if the defendants I'm suing on your behalf have purchased this mandatory liability insurance coverage, then it will pay for claims as a result of our successful tort lawsuit against them up to the limit of their coverage. There are two components to the discovery process that you'll experience, which are as follows. One, documentation discovery, and two, examinations for discovery. The primary purpose of the discovery process is to enable both the plaintiff, you, and the defendant to better understand the case that they have to meet via the exchange of pertinent information and documentation, which is document discovery, combined with cross-examination or asking the other party specific questions while being recorded that's relevant to the issues in dispute in your tort action or lawsuit, which is examination for discovery. The document discovery stage of the process involves an exchange of documents between you and I and the other parties and non-parties, which are relevant to the legal issues in dispute in your tort action. The most essential document in regards to document discovery is what is known as the affidavit of documents. An affidavit of documents includes a sworn statement from you confirming that you have conducted a diligent search of all of your records and made appropriate inquiries of others to inform yourself in order to ensure that your affidavit discloses to the full extent of your knowledge, information, and belief all documents relevant to any matter in issue in your tort action, which are or have been in your possession, control, 
or power. The examination for discovery stage of the process involves obtaining oral evidence from you and a defendant under oath and before trial, where the lawyers for the opposing party ask questions via cross-examination of the opposing party and their lawyer pertaining to the relevant issues contained in the pleadings, such as, but not limited to, the statement of claim and statement of defense I mentioned earlier. Some of the benefits to you that come from proceeding with the mandatory discovery process are, but not limited to, the following. One, assess the strengths and weaknesses of the other party's case before I prepare for trial. Two, narrow the issues for the trial I'll conduct on your behalf, if necessary. And three, potentially reach a favorable and equitable settlement prior to going to trial. The examination for discovery typically takes place inside a boardroom type setting at an official examiner's office so that it can be recorded. This enables us to ask to have it transcribed. So we have a written record of what was said at the examination for discovery. Prior to the commencement of your examination for discovery, you will have the option to swear on the Holy Bible to tell the truth or make an affirmation tell the truth if you're not Catholic. During the course of your examination for discovery, the opposing lawyer will ask for what is known as undertakings, which are formal requests to provide additional information or records not included in your affidavit of documents, but that are relevant to the issues in dispute in your tort action. After the examination for discovery, I'll commence the process of sending out request letters along with your signed authorization and direction forms to third parties, such as, not limited to, your family doctor, employer, and your treatment providers, the Canada Revenue Agency, in order to satisfy the outstanding undertakings as soon as possible. My objective during an examination for discovery where I'm cross-examining the other party and their lawyer are, but not limited to, the following. One, obtain admissions. Two, learn about the evidence in the possession of the opposing party. Three, narrow the issues. And four, determine the strengths and weaknesses of the opposing party's case. If I successfully achieve these objectives, then I'll create an opportunity for a potential early resolution. My objective during an examination for discovery where you are being cross-examined by the other lawyer is to adequately prepare you as, but not limited to, the following. Ensure you are familiar with all of the issues contained in your statement of claim, all of the relevant facts, the accident dynamics of your motor vehicle accident, all of your medical records, and all of your past recorded statements past medical and health history, past work history, pre-existing conditions and non-torturous issues, or injuries and impairments not related to your motor vehicle accident, which can create potential causation issues, as well as protect your credibility, that your oral testimony is consistent with your past recorded statements. The next step is to ask for a trial date, which is known as setting the action down for trial. In order to set your tort action down for trial, I will prepare and file your trial record. If your tort action is defended, meaning the defendant wasn't noted in default for not filing a statement of defense, then I will set your tort action down for trial by doing, but not limited to, the following. One, serving your trial record on the other parties. Two, filing your trial record with the court with proof of service. And three, paying any court filing fees. A private mediation settlement conference is a confidential, informal discussion without prejudice between us and the other parties in your tort action. 
in an attempt to resolve your tort action for an equitable and just settlement prior to trial. It can occur with all parties meeting with an independent, neutral, and unbiased mediator, usually a senior personal injury law lawyer who assists and guides the parties toward our own voluntary resolution by helping us further narrow the issues, better understand the strengths and weaknesses of each other's case, and focus on the important legal issues needed to narrow the gap between our respective settlement proposals. It could also be arranged voluntarily by counsel without a mediator, where the parties meet with their respective lawyers, or the lawyers meet alone and report back to their respective clients. Regardless of what kind of private mediation settlement conference we select, there is always an exchange of comprehensive settlement briefs, which present the settlement offer and outline the theory of the case and the evidence that will be relied upon at trial to justify the award of compensatory damages as being sought. I will draft on your behalf a comprehensive settlement proposal. A global mediation is where I consolidate more than one of your legal proceedings such as your accident benefits claim against your own first party automobile insurer, your long term disability claim against your second party insurer, and what we've been talking about today, your tort lawsuit against the negligent at fault driver and his or her third party automobile insurer into a single private mediation settlement conference. If your tort action has been set down for trial, then just before the actual trial date, we must attend what is known as a pre-trial conference with a judge. Prior to attending the pre-trial conference, I must complete a pre-trial brief or memorandum which provides the pre-trial judge the pertinent information he or she requires to adequately conduct it. Once the pre-trial conference is confirmed by the court, you and I must attend the courthouse, including all the other parties and their respective lawyers, before a trial can proceed. Typically, only the lawyers go into the conference room to meet with the pretrial judge, and the parties remain outside and available to provide instructions to counsel in the event that settlement proposals are made and exchanged between the parties. The judge who conducts the pretrial conference cannot preside at the trial without the consent of all the parties to your tort action. If we can't resolve your tort action at a private mediation settlement conference or at the pre-trial conference, then we proceed to trial. A trial is a coming together of all the parties in your tort action in a formal setting with the authority to adjudicate the dispute and your claims, where the lawyers marshal or reduce the facts the applicable law, and the support of evidence. The lawyers, including myself, argue them in an effective, compelling, and persuasive manner before a prior of fact, either a judge or a jury, who conducts a formal examination of the evidence in order to decide whether the monetary compensation in the form of compensatory damages you seek should be awarded. Subject to an appeal, the decision rendered at a trial is usually the end of the road for your tort action and legal dispute. My witnesses are of two kinds, which are lay witnesses and expert witnesses. A lay witness can essentially only testify on their direct knowledge of what they actually witnessed and not on his or her opinion of anything. An expert witness, on the other hand, is an individual who possesses special knowledge or skill in respect of the subject upon which he or she is called upon to testify after swearing to be objective and providing testimony that serves the court in enhancing its understanding. After he or she is qualified as an expert witness through a qualification process in the court, he or she is then permitted to give opinion evidence, which is limited to his or her area of expertise and is deemed to be necessary to furnish the court of such expertise that is likely outside the experience and knowledge of the presiding judge or jury. 
after the closing addresses from the lawyers representing all the parties in your tort action, in a judge alone case, the presiding judge may make his or her decision at the end of the trial or release his or her decision at a later time, which is known as reserving judgment. If, however, it's a jury trial, then the judge addresses the law, but the jury addresses the facts. The judge will rule on the evidence, instruct the jury about the law, comment on the evidence, decide whether there is sufficient evidence to be considered by the jury. The judge has a duty to determine whether any facts have been established by evidence from which negligence may reasonably be inferred. And the jury has a duty to determine whether from those facts, upon being submitted to them, negligence should be inferred. After the presiding judge completes his or her duty to discharge a jury, they complete their duty and leave the court to deliberate until they reach a verdict. If we disagree with the judgment due to an error in law and or an error in fact, then we can appeal the decision to the Court of Appeal for Ontario. The Supreme Court of Canada articulated the standard of review for errors of law, fact, and mixed law and fact as follows. Quote, where the question is one of pure law, the standard is correctness. The standard of review for findings of fact is one of palpable and overriding error. A palpable error being one that is plainly seen. In negligence cases, the standard of review for questions of mixed fact and law is one of palpable and overriding error. Unless the trial judge made some error in principle, in which case the error may amount to an error of law, which is subject to correctness." End quote. The very last appeal that we can make is to the highest court in the country, which is the Supreme Court of Canada. If you want more information, then please read my blog of the same name called, What Are the Steps in a Tort Lawsuit for Personal Injuries? In my blog, I go into much more detail. In all of the seven stages of a tort action I mention in this blog, as well as provide links to other blogs, such as What Damage Awards Do I Get From a Successful Tort Action, which provide additional information you'll find helpful. I hope you found this information valuable. Remember, my website is your one-stop source for answers to all of your legal questions concerning tort law, personal injury law, and catastrophic impairment law. If you want to book a free consultation with me, then please visit my webpage at rudderlawgroup.ca and click on the free consultation button at the top of the page. Let us be your rudder that steers your legal ship in the right direction. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the like button if you found the content valuable. There you'll also find other vlogs with valuable content on tort law, personal injury law, and catastrophic impairment law. Thank you, and I'll see you in episode three of Personal Injury Lawyer Tips, where I'll bring you more useful legal information. Thank <laughs> you.